Hello everyone, and today we're going to be doing the least squares estimation derivation. This is the core optimization objective of the column filter. So to start off, we're going to motivate our problem. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out what the value of a resistor is. So I know reading these codes is, is a thing that electrical engineers tend to do, uh, but we're going to go a little different way. We're going to take a multimeter and we're just going to take a bunch of readings of the resistance of this resistor. Now, multimeters are not perfect. There's going to be some noise in that sensor reading. So every time I touch two leads here, what I'm going to get is a slightly different value. And what our goal is, is we're going to try to figure out what is the best estimate of the resistance given the sensor readings that I have and some notion about the noise of our multimeter. So to start off, we'll need this thing called the observation model. We talked about this a little bit earlier, and this is similar to the sensor model that we had in particle filtering. But now it's just explicitly linear. So we have this matrix H that maps from a state to a measurement. So this is going to be your measurement Y, your state X, and then some noise V. Now we know that V is explicitly Gaussian. That means it's white noise, um, and it's zero mean. So this is that matrix equation earlier written out explicitly. If we had some vector X with N components, um, what we'd have is each set of the vector multiplied by some value in the matrix. For the resistor example of what we looked at, we actually don't have this other part here. You can ignore this because what you have is you have what is the reading that I got, so the resistance. This would be a 1 because x is also the resistance. And then this is some random noise that's coming from our multimeter. So you'd have our first reading is equal to x1 plus v1. Now, V is going to change, but X is going to remain the same. We're assuming that our resistor is not changing over time. The resistance value is the same throughout the entire experiment. And then you're going to take N of these different readings, and that's what this equation would look like. So now we concatenate this into the vector case, which is what you see here in this equation. So this V would just be the concatenation of this vector. This X is actually a scalar. It's just one value, X1. And this H is going to make sure that everything matches up dimensionality-wise. And then you have the Y, which is your different readings. So then what we can do is write the expected noise like this. This is the error for a given reading um, is equal to Y, which is our measurement, minus H times X. And X hat here is the estimate of the state and not the true state. So now that we have this, we can look at what is the error. What we want to do is have the lowest error on average. So if you were to write that out, the optimization objectives would be to minimize this. So we have some j, which is our objective function, as we talked about in the optimization week. And we have epsilon squared here. And this is for each reading. So we want to minimize the error of each reading summed together. So you can rewrite this equation in the vector form like this. Um, and if you actually plug in our equations back using this epsilon format here, you get this. So then we can take this equation and we can simplify it even further. So when I take the transpose of these two values, what I actually get is x hat transpose h transpose. So this is the transpose and I'm just going to distribute this out as we normally would. So you get out this equation here. So now what we want to do is we want to find the minimum. So if you remember from the optimization week, how can we find a minima? We can find extrema and then figure out if those are minimums. So we can take the partial of j with respect to x, set that equal to 0, and if we solve for the vector at that point, that value should be a critical point. That value will be a critical point. And if we can prove that that's a minimum, we found the x vector that minimizes the error, which means that we have the most accurate state given our sensor readings. Or it means that we have the most accurate value of the resistor. So I'm going to give you some identities of matrix partials here. So if we take the partial with respect to x of x transpose qx, you get out this equation here. Uh, so q transpose plus q times x. And what you can also do is if q transpose is equal to q, so the matrix is symmetric, you can simplify it to this equation here. The other identity is the partial of qx is equal to q transpose. So if we use these identities to take this partial with respect to this equation, we get out the one at the bottom here. y transpose y cancels out because it does not depend on x, so its derivative is 0. The other ones just follow the identity. So now what we can do is set that equal to 0 and solve. So that math is written out here. 
What we get out the end is this equation here. So we have the best estimate that we have given our sensor readings is equal to h transpose times h to the inverse times h transpose times y. So this is really nice. It depends only on our sensor readings and our understanding of how our state and sensor readings are related. So if we jump back to our simple example, we have h is just a vector of ones. So if we plug that in and solve for this equation above, what we end up getting is just take the average value of our sensor readings. And this makes a lot of sense. This matches our intuition of how we should be averaging our sensor readings. Since they're all equally likely, and they're all the same, I have the same confidence in all of them, what I do is I just take the average of them and assume that's the correct value. That's going to be the best value statistically. So there's a different derivation of least squares that we're not going to talk about, and this is going to be using the weighted least squares. So now what I have is I have some weighting based on each value. So I have this R matrix here, which essentially says that I have some changing variance with respect to my noise. And what this means is that some readings are more accurate than others. So if I was back in my multimeter example, and I was checking the value of a resistance, on some of these I have really good contact. I am touching the leads exactly. And in some, uh, my lead's a little bit off. So when my lead's a little bit off, I get a worse reading. And if I'm keeping track of that as I'm taking readings, I can still use those bad readings. I just want to say I'm less confident in them. And that's what you're doing here with this R matrix. So this is our covariance matrix. And it is a diagonal matrix, which means that everything is zero except for the diagonal. And these just represent the variance of each reading. So now I can reformulate my optimization objective like this. So I'm trying to minimize the error divided by my variance. So if I do that and I follow the exact same form of what I had earlier, what I end up with is I get this form of the least squares algorithm. So this is exactly what we had before, because we had x hat is equal to h transpose h inverse h transpose y. But now what I have is this R matrix, this R inverse. And this is going to be weighting each value based on its variance. So this, least square, so this weighted least squares algorithm is really great. It allows us to compute the value when we have readings with different levels of confidence. But the issue you can see here, pretty obviously, is that I have to redo everything every time I get a new reading. I have to recompute this H matrix because it depends on all of my sensor readings. So there's a form of the least squares algorithm that is recursive. And what it does is allow us to get around the fact that we need to recompute our H matrix for each new measurement. And what we can do is essentially have something that looks like a running average over our measurements and we don't have to use the entire history every time we do an update. So we're going to be looking at that derivation really briefly. So this is the output of what that derivation would look like. We have our exact same measurement model, but now we have that our x hat, so our best estimate of the thing at the current time, so I've seen t measurements, uh, what is my best estimate, is equal to what was my estimate previously, so this is the recursive nature. And then I have this k matrix, which is called our gain matrix, which I'm going to skip the derivation of, and you can look it up if you're interested, multiplied by the difference between my actual reading y and my expected sensor reading, which is represented by this multiplication here. So the math below is going to help us prove an important property about the recursive least squares estimation problem, that it's an unbiased estimator. And this is a really desirable property because it says that on average, the estimate of x hat will equal the true value x. So if we take this, we're going to be looking at what is the expected error we're going to get out. Um, so first what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation and plug this in here to get this. And then what we can do is we can simplify these two. And what those two actually equal to is my previous error. So my error at the previous step because it's the true value minus my previous estimate. And then what I can do is I can sub in my equation for y. So then continuing on to simplify. So then continuing on as we simplify, what we can do is we can pull this vt out with k. So you get minus kvt here. And then what we can do is simplify this again as the error at the previous time step. And then what we can do is we can factor out that error at the previous time step and we get 
i minus kh uh, times the error at the previous time step. And the reason that we can split these expectations is because these events are independent. And this is an assumption of the problem set up. So what we get out at the end is this equation down here at the bottom. So the property of an unbiased estimator comes in if we take the expected value of v of t is equal to zero, which we know to be true because that's from our problem set up, and then we have the expected error is equal to zero at the previous time step, then our expected error at the next time step should also equal zero. This means that we're not picking up additional. So the next thing I wanna talk about is this covariance matrix, and this is the actual form of the covariance matrix. So we have some vector x, which is equal to x1 all the way to xn, and this is a vector of random variables. And all the covariance matrix has is what is the variance of each random variable with each other as well as themselves. So along the diagonal is the variance with itself, and on the sides is the variance with other variables. A lot of times what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a diagonal matrix with everything else being zero. And this is because we're assuming that our random variables and our vector are not related parts of our state are independent of each other when it comes to noise. So if we take and we use our equations of recursive least squares estimation, what we get out is here. So this is our sensor reading again, and these three are the equations that will allow us to update our recursive least squares estimator. This is our gain matrix, K, and this is our covariance matrix, P. Now this K matrix is gonna show up in one really important place for the state estimate. So that is right here. And you can think of that as how much do I wanna change my prior estimate, x of t minus one, in my new setup with x of t based on my sensor reading and its prior state. So my, what's my expected sensor reading given my prior state? Remember that we expect that our state is not changing, so this makes a lot of sense. So the rest is the update for the covariance equation. And essentially the way to look at this is that it depends on the prior covariance as well as some weighting based on K. And we have our measurement covariance here. In this lecture, what we did is we found a way to compute the expected or most likely state given some sensor reading. So this is based on our sensor model or the matrix H. The second thing we did was we derived an explicit equation to do this. And this was done using the least squares estimator. And finally, the thing we did is that we reformulated our least squares estimator to work online, which just means that's running as we get new sensor readings. Every time I get a new sensor reading, I can tell you a better estimate of my state based on that sensor reading. And I don't have to recompute all the different values. So this is really nice and all, but we're lacking something important. And the thing that we're lacking is that our state is not changing during the measurements. This is an assumption that we made, and there's no way to get out of it in the current setup. So this is what the common filter is going to allow us to do. That there's going to be some motion on our state uh, during the measurements. 